of it. Uh, and as with the other panels, uh, we've got four well-informed and experienced people here. We've got Kelly Hector on my right, who is the HR director of Churchill Retirement Living. We've got Barry Cullen uh, from the RICS, who is Director of Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, we've got Isla McFarlane, editor of showhouse.co.uk. And we've got Catherine Sewell, who is the head of HR at Keir Living. Uh, so they will all have um, views about this. This, of course, is a uh, particularly important issue for this industry. We heard in the previous panels, uh, we heard from Alison how you know, we're trying to tackle these skills requirements by uh, appealing to uh, so far to 50% of the population. And I've seen figures which say that only 1% of people working on housing sites are women. Um, only a quarter of architects are women. Why isn't that a lot higher? What are we going to do about these issues and gender pay gaps and so on uh, in the future? Um, now, all these people have some experience of dealing with this. So as before, I'm going to ask them to give their opening thought, and then we'll, we'll get into some of these issues. So Kelly, would you like to go first? Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Kelly Hector. I'm the Head of Human Resources at Churchill Retirement Living. Um, I'm incredibly proud to work for Churchill, and one of those reasons is we have a very good split in terms of our diversity of population there. Believe it or not, we have 49% of our workforce actually are female. Um, and in the construction industry, I think we'd all admit that is quite a high ratio. However, they're not necessarily out on site. They are mainly in our sales and marketing, um, roles and equally they are in our head office and administration functions. One of the things that we do try to do is promote those diverse roles that we do have and I think as an industry that's something that we do need to get better at. We do need to demonstrate these key roles that we have across um, our sector to try to attract um, diversity into our industry. But we do also do some really great things. We mustn't lose sight of that. One of the things that we were talking about when I knew that I was coming to join this debate was that we do believe that we should get into the hearts and minds of um, school, not necessarily leavers. I'm very much talking about those that are still at school, that still have that opportunity to create passion and drive and desire to come into what I've learned is a really fascinating, growing, diverse, exciting, challenging role. And I don't think we do enough of that. I think we do it all individually, but we haven't actually come together. And that's something I've heard quite common in the previous two debates, which is we're all doing lots of things, um, and they're all happening, but actually we need to come together more to obviously communicate that. And there is obviously that core, what I call the golden thread, which is how do we inspire those? Um, I've got a bit of a, a fascinating anecdote, which is um, I have the privilege to have a wonderful HR team. And part of that HR team includes trainers. And one of our trainers um, is a 35 plus years experienced site manager. And in the last 18 months, he learned that I was going to become his line manager. Oh, heck, a woman. And he had never had that before. He'd never had that opportunity to actually work um, in a, a, a department that was quite diverse, the views the, and everything else that went with it. And one of the things that he now is, is he's a culture carrier out there every day on site, talking about the core topics that we, in my role, are always passionate about, but actually he's able to transverse that through. And there was something that, um, I believe it was Helen, I can't actually see her at the moment. Um, hello, hi there. Um, one of the things that she, you mentioned, Helen, which was when we get those core diverse people out on site, we should really shout about it. And I'm absolutely with you on that, because the more we do that, the more that we will see people coming through. So um, for me, it's around promotion of those core roles and actually that real inclusiveness that we have. Thank you. Uh, now, Barry, you, gonna, you must see things across the industry quite a bit in your mm. institute, so you give your opening thought on this. Mm. Thanks, everyone. Um, yes, in the 
Um, our ICS, we, we like to use the phrase that, you know, everywhere you've been, a surveyor has been there before you. So it is right across the board. And certainly, um, we would like to see a profession that reflected the society that it serves. Currently, our um, members that are women are 14% overall. Um, with very low levels in terms of um, people from black and minority ethnic groups as well. 1.4% of our professional, qualified professionals come from those communities. Um, it's, a, it's, been a, it's, it's been an endemic problem for some time, but one that RICS has been tackling, certainly over the last five years. Um, and certainly we're beginning to see an emerging talent pipeline that is looking a lot more diverse than it previously did. So. 27% of our newly qualified members are women. Um, one of the areas that we are increasingly trying to tackle is the fact that people don't necessarily feel that they can bring their whole selves to work. We have a real issue with um, undeclared ethnicity. So we need to be able to promote a profession that feels accessible to all. I don't believe there's only 20, uh, 20 Bengali surveyors in the country. I just don't believe that. I feel it's much more than that. But we need to be able to create an environment and a profession that people are able to celebrate themselves within. And certainly that's key to the role um, that I find myself in. But we've done a great deal, um, certainly in the last two years. Rather than waiting for everyone to come and find out what surveyors do, because most people don't know, we carried out a survey last year with parents. 40% um, of those parents didn't know what surveyors did or didn't know what surveying was as a, as a uh, career path. That's something that we have to tackle. Um, we engaged with these wonderfully uh, entrepreneurial um, YouTube vloggers. So everyone wants to be a YouTube vlogger these days at uh, a certain age. And we worked with a predominantly um, young women audience. So we attracted a, a woman who vlogs about um, fashion and retail and education. And uh, through that video, we were able to um, get 20,000 views, something that RICS never got before. 85% of that audience were women aged 13 to 24. So it's about going to where people are rather than expecting them to come and find out about this wonderful aspirational career that they've never heard about before. Um, and in tackling some of the areas of um, low level, so we, we also worked with a, a blogger who has 4 million followers on uh, YouTube. Um, his video generated 100,000 views for us, and that was with young men interested in gaming, Pokemon Go, Minecraft, all of those things that are, are far way above my head. Um, but it was that attempt to go to where people inhabit, go to the space that young people are inhabiting and be there to be able to um, work with them and, and portray that their interest in technology could lead to an interesting career in surveying. So we've got, a, we've got a job to do in terms of engaging. We've also got a job to do in terms of retaining. We see an inordinate number of our um, female professionals leave the profession sort of mid-career and don't return. And that's a real area of concern and one that we are tackling, certainly within my role, to be able to um, retain those women, ensure that they then progress into leadership roles. Because as was mentioned around gender pay gaps, what we're beginning to see is a lack of women leaders, and that's certainly an area that's uh, a great concern for us. Right, thank you. That's uh, also a good introduction to this, and shows that YouTube vlogging is taking place uh, in some quarters. Yep. Um, so, Isla, you give us your opening perspective. Mm. Hi everyone, I'm the editor of showhouse.co.uk. Uh, we recently launched a job site specifically for the house building industry, which I'll come on to in a moment. As a member of the media, I frequently have to write reports on a company that's come out with a study on how to recruit women. There's no magic trick to it. You know, show a woman a good opportunity and nothing's going to hold her back from applying for it. Um, it didn't take a picture of a female in a white coat to get women to fight to become part of the medical profession. If we can show people that house building is exciting and progressive, well paid and respected, there's really nothing that's going to hold people back. And I, I think the media does have a really big part to play in this. I deal with a lot of very bad, unflattering stock photography of ugly men in hard hats laying bricks. It's not representative of the industry, it's not representative of the future of the industry. I see a lot of really badly written literature 
Um, I still get press releases on female architects. I think that's like a male architect, but cheaper. It's, again, just not representative of the industry at all. And this isn't symptomatic of a prejudice in the industry. This is symptomatic of really the age of and gender of the average worker in the industry. And really recruiting practices that are over-reliant on old contacts and old networks. And I do think house builders have really upped their game in terms of awareness campaigns, in terms of apprenticeship programs, in terms of career progression. Unfortunately, it's, it's not necessarily where who they want to recruit is looking. A recent study showed that 80% of millennials, they all find their first jobs on mobile devices. Um, and this is why we launched our recruitment site, because this is really where they go to find that crucial entry point, and this is where house builders can go to find people who they don't need to convince to join the industry, that these people are willing, able, and really want to join. They just need to know where to look. I don't think stereotypes particularly put women off going into the, in any industry. I, I think if they did, we wouldn't have a female prime minister now. I think if anyone sees a well-paid, well-advertised job in the right place, I think they'll apply. Right, there's a very clear view. May I show that it's uh, an exciting, advancing, highly professional industry and the right people come, the diverse people come anyway. Um, now, Catherine, what, what's your view on all of this? Okay, well, by way of an introduction, I'm the head of HR for Keir Living, which is the residential part of our business. Um, at Keir, we've begun our journey with diversity and inclusion in the last couple of years, and we've tried to approach this from the perspective of achieving a balanced business. So we're trying to avoid um, going down silos of focusing on gender or race or sexual orientation and actually looking at what are the inclusive behaviours that we should be demonstrating across our business? How do we encourage, as Barry has said, um, for people to feel included and bring their whole self to work? And we're at the beginning of this journey, so we're by no means experts, but we're starting the conversation, we're starting the awareness. Um, one of the things that's really important, we've touched on a lot of attraction to the industry, but actually we really need to look inside our own businesses what are the behaviours that make an industry, a, a company inclusive and make people want to stay? Because it's all well and good, the passion, the energy, the enthusiasm, the glossy magazines with the appropriate images to attract people to the industry. But if we've still got a very male-dominated um, and, and typical associated behaviours going on in the organisation, we simply won't retain the talent, be that women or people from diverse backgrounds. So it has to be focused inwardly as well as externally that the people are attracted to join the business that they were genuinely sold to join. Great. Well, some very clear uh, opening thoughts here. Now, what are the barriers to this then? The, uh, you know, we've heard about poor communication, but where does this come from? Um, what is the, um, what's the greatest problem for each of you to overcome in your organizations or other organizations you do? Is it a generational Thing? Is it a, something particular to this industry? What's the, what's the biggest challenge here in trying to implement the vision you've all set out? Who wants to, Ida, do you want to comment on that? Well, I think we do have a lot of negative press stories on women in the construction industry. Many of us will have grown up walking past construction sites where we're more likely to be wolf whistled at than recruited. So and I, I think there is that, it's a dated perception, but I, I still think it exists. Um, I think as well, people don't differentiate construction from house building, and they're two very different beasts. Construction, unfortunately, has one of the biggest gender pay gaps in the UK. It comes a close second only to financial services. So I think this, and I think we, you were talking about women leave at a certain point in their career. This isn't unique to construction or house building. Um, it, it happens across, across every industry. A uh, third of women in a recent study said what would really make them stay in an organisation is flexible hours. Um, I think house building needs to differentiate itself. All right, so we've got one of the biggest lags in, in pay, but that also gives us the real opportunity to take the lead. Um, I, I think we can show that we can really be a progressive and modern industry. Again, I think it's a question of better communication, and I think... A, it does help to have uh, visible role models in the industry as well. I think we've talked about that earlier. So you can actually 
not necessarily women in a hard hat. I don't think many of us particularly, I don't think many people, male or female, may aspire to that. And the majority of jobs that are going to be created over the next few years are going to be in managerial positions. And I think that needs to be communicated as well. Uh, so I think it's really a question of updating, really getting rid of old stereotypes. So we've got old perceptions that may be out of date now. We've got a failure to understand the distinctiveness of house building. Uh, as opposed to construction in general. What are the other barriers here what, for you, Barry? What, what do you well, think? I think um, particularly with surveyors, I was speaking to someone just before um, we started, and it is the, you know, the professionalism of, of our particular element of the, um, the sector is probably not that well known. And I think, um, as Isla mentioned, you know, many of the careers that are going to be available are managerial, and it is about the <coughs> understanding of organisations with greater automation coming in, and it's always been seen as being, well, that's a real threat to quantity surveyors, they're gonna end up as data managers. Well, actually, that lends itself more to um, you know, greater flexibility within the workplace. You know? mm -hmm. And I think we, we need to be able to address some of the um, opportunities that, that technology offers, not only in the, um, you know, the, the streamlining of the industry, but also the opportunities it can open to bring in a more diverse um, workforce in, in, in terms of where they need to be. I think one of the challenges that we, um, we have is around generational um, understanding of flexible working um, until, and I, I think there'll be a sea change over the next couple of years that, that the more, and I put myself in this, this position, I, you know, I'm, um, I have to be around to pick up kids, I have to look after an 89 year old father-in-law who for my sins lives with us now. and. Um, you know, the more that that's happening to people of my age group, who tend to be those white male men in leadership roles, once that begins to impact, then change can begin to happen. Because then once it's real for them, as there is a need for greater flexibility, some of these things that these incredibly talented <coughs> women have been shouting for years that they needed, um, will begin hopefully to be adapted. So we need, we need male champions within the sector to say that to increase the diversity of the, um, of the professional careers, there needs to be an understanding of, of what needs to change in order to make that possible for people. Mm. Thank you. Other points on this? Um, Kelly or, or yeah. Catherine? Yeah, happily. We, um, I absolutely agree. I think there need to be role models that are not just considered poster girls and boys to support with the diversity initiative, but there need to be champions. So, you know, our executive director, John Anderson, who will be speaking in the leadership panel, is a champion for diversity and inclusion, and he's putting a lot of energy in our, our business about, you know, let's talk to these people. What, what would make a difference? Um, it's, it's multifaceted. It's about all of the different stages that you can impact on people during their career, the attraction, the development, the retention at different stages in their um, life that may require flexible um, requirements, and it's also thinking about the development. Um, so there are different levers to pull for different people at different stages in their career, and we will only know what those are if we have those conversations. Um, I think one of the barriers that is external to our own organisations was touched on this morning, and that's around how do we influence parents and teachers to understand that there is a breadth of skills and um, fantastic career opportunities in a really exciting sector uh, that don't just require you to be out on site you know, laying bricks and, and myth-busting um, with some of the influencers who are before they enter into our industry. Um, so, Kelly, how are we going to do that sort of thing, you know, across that you talked about, um, working across the industry, and so on, Catherine made the point, how, how is the industry going to communicate this changed nature of itself? Well, I think we need to get past that kind of, um, a lot of parents will be very concerned about recessions and impacts and changes along those, mm -hmm. those aspects of careers for their children coming up through. And I think what we need to do is promote what is, what is a steady um, and, and growing, going back to your point about the number of houses that are being built over mm -hmm. the next number of years. Mm -hmm. This is a huge growth industry and there are many challenges and many aspects that people can come into um, in order to grow, whether it be surveying, whether it be out on site. And also I, the other area I would look at is our subcontractor base. We're quite unique in terms of how we actually um, uh, structure our businesses. So within our subcontractors, how can we support them? How can we develop them in terms of the diversity and inclusion debate? 
and um, get them to come through into other roles that might be within the house building sectors that we might represent. And is there a great role model, is there a, um, it's probably a difficult question to ask people from particular companies, but is mm. there, you know, Isla, when you look at the industry, do you say, well, that organisation or that company or th those companies or that individual, they are really showing no comment. how to do this? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And any, any views on that, or is that a difficult question? To, I think uh, it's fair to say that our industry are playing catch up a little bit compared mm. to other industries, and um, so I think we're on that journey, and that's a good starting point. I think one of the really big uh, challenges that we do have is the confidence to talk about this. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lack of a confidence within our own organisation to say, actually, I don't know what I should or shouldn't say, or what yeah. I should and shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. And it's about equip equipping our managers, our middle managers, with the confidence and the skills to be able to say, to have the appropriate conversations, to lead with the appropriate behaviours, and that will then, it, this is a cultural um, shift. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think one of the barriers at the moment is that we still consider it a bit of a taboo to talk about diversity and inclusion and if we could mm -hmm. push through that barrier and normalize it and focus on behaviors inclusivi inclusivity and respect for one another then we wouldn't have to be having a conversation about diversity at all right so Rupa, a whole what house conference on diversity for mm -hmm. top managers as yeah. uh, might be a good idea yeah. I, yeah. think, I think that's a really very good point because I think that what we do need to do is 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 demystify it and not be afraid to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And um, like you say, you know, we are playing catch ups. I've not always worked in the construction industry. I've worked in other industries where this topic has been debated long and hard for many, many, many years. Um, but what's good is we are now tabling this as an agenda item. Mm -hmm. It's vital. One of the things that we're trying to do at Churchill is promote that values culture. We, we're talking about things like bystander policies. You know, no, no one is going to be a bystander. You know, we're calling things out. We're respecting each other. And if behaviours aren't such to promote that respectful culture, then we, we want to know about it. So we're very much value-led. And I think when you start promoting that value-led culture, it starts opening up debates like this. It starts enabling people to just... Um, be themselves and have these really open dialogues that maybe you know we have at home, maybe we would have in other areas, but actually from a house building perspective, let's be brave, let's shout it out and let's call it out as well. I, I think it's important to emphasise that this is a cultural shift. I mean, even the Absolutely. army has had to become braver with its mm -hmm. recruitment campaign. Yes. Um, and I think as well this is symptomatic again uh, of an older generation. Um, and I think the natural remedy to this is a recru new recruits from the millennial generation. And again, so I think it, this comes down to how we find the right people to come in, and I do think there'll be a natural remedy. What I would hate to see is the conversation shifting to how we accommodate women, because I think that never helps. It mm. never it doesn't encourage people to hire them, and I think it makes, an, in, it makes a huge gender divide added into something alien, and I don't want to see people left out of the conversation, as, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, of ethnic minorities and disabilities. Mm -hmm. It, we always end up talking about gender, but it's important not to leave those behind either. But I think this is a, a natural cultural shift, mm. um, and I think the only real way to speed that up is to actually broaden our recruitment base. Yeah. I'd agree with mm. you, and actually looking at other industries and bringing them in those transferable skills, because by trans bringing in transferable skills from outside and looking at retraining and, and, re and giving development opportunities, <laughs> that will enable us to have those culture carriers that can start promoting the diversity topic within our own companies. Yeah. And I think we're, we've addressed, certainly at the um, entrant level, um, so to become chartered now from August this year, you will have to undertake an understanding of competency around diversity and inclusion, whether that's unconscious bias training, being able to build a diverse um, team together. So, you know, right from the off, we want people to be conscious of this and being able to address things in a much more inclusive way. The senior um, people at the top of firms, people in HR and L&D, get this absolutely. You know, we've got CEOs, I remember sitting in a, a group of CEOs, all white male and over 50, but they all believed in, in diversity being a key priority. It is that middle tranche of management, and it is being able to reflect back to them the importance of unconscious bias and the importance of diversity and inclusion in a way that they're not going to be put off by. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, I, I heard one event organiser who's looking to do something around 
political cor political correctness and all that nonsense to get those people in the room <laughs> and then to say you can solve your skills gap <laughs> by being more diverse mm -hmm. so it's about addressing things from a you know coming from a side view really in terms of how can you frame the conversation to get mm -hmm. the best benefit out of that yeah we've just to build on that we've actually tried to be cr quite creative in care and we've um, created a board game which can be used in a corporate setting either with you know um, execs, exec suite um, leaders through to on a site with apprentices and it has been rolled out across various parts of the care group and it is a really creative way to start the conversation it's a marmite as a tool not everybody loves it um, but it whatever it does it creates an awareness and it's slightly less formal than sitting down and doing training or having a lecture or reading about it or it, it actually gets you talking and it gets you thinking um, and it could be a 20 minute session or it could be you know a half a day session so that's something that we've implemented as a tool that um, to your point about doing things differently is quite a creative approach some very wise comments here but I'm sure there are some um, from uh, everybody else as well anybody want to come in with a question or comment or suggestion on this issue? Anything we're missing here? Yes, Claire. Microphone's on its way. Thank you, I'm Bruce Boughton from Lovell Partnerships. We've talked about um, perhaps society's got an outdated stereotype of what construction is and that we, we as an industry have moved on. And, and we can slap ourselves on the back about things like we don't have pinups anymore and there's probably a lot less wolf whistling than there used to be. But I don't think we're especially a welcoming place, especially for women. And we've got to be honest about that with ourselves. It's not really about the marketing and getting into girls' schools and things. It's actually we've got to change as an industry. And I think the number one thing we could do to be more welcoming, especially to women, but also perhaps to the ethnic minorities, is to eliminate swearing on site. It's, it is a macho environment, and I think that is a huge symptom of it, and yet we tolerate it. You know, it's not just tolerated, it's custom and practice. And actually, if we're really honest about it, I think it's the number one symptom of us being unfriendly to women in our industry. I have to stay. I started my career in a newsroom, and the women were worse at swearing than the men were. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did introduce a swear box, and it, it brought, got us a very good round at the end of the week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And other co also, uh, yes, lady over there, further along the same row, and then I'll ask you all to comment on several points. Hi, hi there. As an introduction, I'm an assistant site manager from Red Row, and I'm based in a site, and I thought I should have... I should speak up because yeah. after listening to all the all the top people out there, and I'm the one on site working 24, not 24, but eight, 10 hours, 12 hours uh, every day. So I thought uh, I should put up my views. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, the uh -huh. communication inside is lots of swearing, all that. And when I initially started on site, I'm based in Harrow, Town Square. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the only woman, and there were 200 workers on site. 200 and just one. I went out there when I said, like, I had a, when I said people to do something, they're just staring at me, like, where is he from? So I think the only way to get rid of this is to recruit more of a woman into construction. Mm. That's the only way, absolutely. Because uh, while talking about, like, earlier, uh, when uh, Catherine said uh, about uh, getting more people into the construction is the only way to sort out uh, the issue. So as a woman, uh, at, the, at the minute, uh, Red Rose given me the opportunity to support everything. Like if I have to go back to my background, uh, I started off as an architect and sifted into construction. Uh, and uh, no one was uh, appreciating my decision of getting into construction because they have a, a thought, like a pre preset thought of like, it's all for men, not for women. But actually recruiting more women into construction and uh, bringing them in the foreground. Like, I have my own story that uh, recently I shared within the platform of Red Row. And with that, many women could actually relate to that, you see. So they can actually understand if you start coming up and t sharing your story with them in a personal level. Because I understand, like, all of us sitting here and discussing about this uh, does touch the top, 
top group, but the bottom bit where the workers are there, and there's just one woman working in 200, in among 200 women. I mean, the perception is absolutely different from how you guys are discussing it, but at least I made my point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Well, that's, that's a very important insight uh, from the uh, from her side. Um, anybody else got some experiences on this they want to share or suggestions they want to make? Uh, yeah, Rupert, yeah. They're bringing the mic anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting, actually, going, almost going back to where we started with Ashley's experience, that it's not just about the industry itself getting its act together. Again, it has to come back to, to parents, to careers at school, because assume if they're not giving the encouragement um, to a guy from a bricklaying family to get into the industry, a male, you know, what, what are they saying to encourage females into the industry? So I think it's, it's got to start back there as well and work up back through the industry. Mm -hmm. Well, what about, uh, what about any reflection on this point and the points that um, were made about uh, swearing and culture on site and the example we had of uh, working with 200 men? Any Well, that's on one that? of the things that, we, uh, that my chairman and I were talking about was how do we get the hearts and minds earlier? And that's not, that's not necessarily gender-specific or anything along those lines, but how do we really promote that? Do you feel, as a female on site, that if we did do more education as a sector within the young, in, in, within the younger generation, that would ha that would ha you'd see an improvement coming through? Do you think that would help? If you don't mind me asking you. Yes, do come back. Do, do, uh, no, it's fine. Go ahead. Basically, that's a very fantastic question you've asked because. At the minute, we are trying to the fact that I did my master's from uh, one of this university, city university I did it. So I'm actually working with their recruitment team to get more students in there yes. and have a day in sight. Because yes. when I got into construction site, I was absolutely shocked because that wasn't what I was expecting. Mm. I've never been into the construction site because of lo lots of health and safety aspects of it. So when I went in there, it was like they were pouring, uh, you know, digging everything. And I was like, what am I doing here? You know, so it's like, Sometimes, just to have an insight or a day or something like we just did recently, we brought the students from City University and took them out on site for a day just for, to have a look of how the site is because the, the last thing you want is to get a lot of people in just to <coughs> make them realize like this is not the industry they want to be in. So I think that's where the gap lies and that's where you guys would need to step up and uh, bring more people into it and show them the realistic view that's been talked earlier as well about the, not just the glamorous, you know, like a role model thing, but the reality of construction that's, that goes within, like lots of men, most of them uh, not completed their degree. So we are actually in a way uh, like the knowledgeable top group actually yes. working with the, the uneducated group, sorry, not uneducated, but less educated group. So that's, that's where the complications come into and mm -hmm. that's where I think uh, you guys might want to come up with more a day into construction sort of session to raise that and like promote more people to come in. So okay, thank you. thank you. And other comments from the panel on any of the points that have been made so far? I think just a couple of things about visibility. That's a, a key area for us, I think. Um, more visible, they tend to be um, female role models. We had a fantastic um, lot of people posting into with the hashtag of surveying sisterhood and the, it generated a global audience so there were women from all over the world using that hashtag showing themselves on site talking about their experience in the industry you know and we've got some it's our 150th anniversary this year so we are really celebrating the achievements of women throughout um, surveying through that, that, that um, celebration so it is certainly something that visibility is, is key one of the other areas are aspects of diversity that often gets, um, not disregarded, but doesn't get mentioned as much is um, around socioeconomic background. And certainly some of the work that we've done there, we've, um, social mobility I know is a, is a, a, a conflicting argument at the moment. And I, I, I come from one of the coldest spots in the country, being from Barrow in Furness. But um, I'm really keen to see that we engage people who would never have thought of a professional career before. Um, so we sponsor a school out in Clacton, in the poorest ward in the country, in Jaywick. We've got young people that have gone through a qualification there that are now working for major um, <coughs> construction firms and they are progressing 
in ways that they would never have thought to do so. You know, and we need to see that there is elements of that adopted. One of the things that that, that allows is a GCSE equivalent in design, engineering, and construction. Not a, oh, if you're one of those bad kids, you can go off and do some labor in at the end of your school because you're not going to amount to anything else. It is a seamless route into a technical, professional career in construction, engineering, or design. So it's, it's being able to promote those opportunities in areas that, that people wouldn't have necessarily thought. And you know, I was up in one of our school's visits that we went up to in Derbyshire, it was an ex-mining town, and um, the head of that school said, when she popped in, she said, there was kids in that room that had never spoken in front of their peers before. There were girls that I've never seen engaged so much. You took something that I thought was a particularly stuffy career in surveying and made it seem really exciting. And it's about being able to package that in the right way, inspire young people, but also make the environment accessible for them throughout. And I agree, you know, recruit more women, it will change our profession. And that's certainly an attempt that we're, we're looking to do. And especially as a media organisation, we are very serious about making sure we speak to women in the profession and try to report their stories. And I think your point is a really important one. That does need to be really visible. Um, and certainly some of the articles we've produced on women in construction are among our most popular and create the most engagement. There is an interest there. Um, and we do have a responsibility. Um, uh, the media has a responsibility to promote that and take that seriously. Anybody else want to come in? Quick final comment on this. Uh, yes, sir, yes. Uh, on the aisle there again. Hi, it's um, Paul McGuire from the Built Environment Communications Group. Just a, a question and observation. A lot of the discussions have been about female representation within the industry, but back to Ida's point, there's the whole black and Asian minority ethnic yeah. debate that doesn't seem to get as much attention. And it strikes me, is that because people in this industry don't understand those communities quite so well and should more be done to outreach to, to those communities to get more people involved rather than just focus on the female right. side? Which I is I just I another important part of diversity. Isla, you look like you have views on this. Yeah, mm. uh, yeah I think there, I there is a gap there. I think also women, frankly, are easier to find. We make, we make up 50% of the population, you know, ethnic minorities. The Asian population will make up maybe 5% and disabilities, it's going to be fewer than that. So I, I think perhaps gender diversity is an easier conversation to have. There's a lot of research that says when you start the journey on diversity and inclusion, if you start with gender, it gets the conversation going and then the rest can follow. And I agree with you, it shouldn't be isolated to one particular area of focus. Um, at Kia, we started with gender um, and part of the reason of that for all that was we looked at our own data and of course, um, everybody ticks a form when they join the business about their um, gender, but you have the right not to declare um, on many other factors, whether it's um, ethnicity, disability, etc. So we just didn't know enough about our people um, to really know what do you need and want? How can we start improving the culture and the, industry, the business that you're working in? Um, we have seen that declaration rates have gone up. We've started to um, create a network for the LGBT, um, people who identify as LGBT+, plus, which is also including allies. So it's not saying this is specifically for people who only identify as LGBT. It's actually, you know, we have a role as allies to think about how it is entering our organisation. Um, so I think you're right. There is a confidence about gender as the starting point, but it is much more... Um, far-reaching and that's why we've called our diversity strategy in Keir the balanced business strategy because it is not just about what box you tick to describe your characteristics but it's about behaviours um, as well. I think from, from a surveying perspective um, a university we accredit 51 universities um, and courses that they, they deliver ethnically very very diverse but not in terms of gender so it is we're seeing at that earlier emerging talent pipeline, we have a similar issue around declaration. And I spoke to a couple of um, black surveyors who were saying, if I know I've got the job, I'll tick the box. If I haven't, I won't. You know, and so there is that, that fear that if you call yourself out, that's not going to benefit you because they see it as being, um, you know, it, it isn't particularly um, ethnic, ethnically diverse um, 
profession or industry but actually the truth is it is it's just it's it's not called out enough and again that comes back to visibility we've got some amazing um she's a qs and works for tfl but she's She's someone that, you know, a young black woman from East London. I said, I'd, once she came off stage after having spoken, I was like, I want to bottle you and take you everywhere because <laughs> she inspired me. You know, she made me want to get into surveying, you know. And, um, and it's about being able to have those role models that reflect the people so that you can see people who look like you mm -hmm. and sound like you and inspire you to come into something. So I agree, but I think the gender is a great starting point. I think given that our customers all live mm. in houses, you know, yeah. <laughs> actually we need to think about how we're reflective of our customers and how do we have those conversations with our customers too. It's not just the organisation um, that are impacted by it. We're designing homes for a multitude of people with different needs and requirements. Uh, and we need to be celebrating when we're actually taking into consideration mm -hmm. the diverse needs of our customers to start also uh, influencing that diversity <coughs> strategy. And crucially, diversity of ideas and experience will be yeah. vital for any organisation succeeding uh, in such an industry in the future. Um, well, I think our panel have uh, given us a good uh, insight into these issues. And of course, there is no way of tackling the issues we talked about earlier in apprenticeship, uh, apprenticeships and training without getting this issue of diversity right in all its many forms. Uh, so we're going to, in our last uh, panel in a moment, we're going to be asking uh, some leading figures whether they've really got this point, uh, as well as other ideas uh, for the future. So thank you again to another excellent panel. Please give them a round of applause. Thanks. And I'll ask the, uh, the final panel to come up. We're going to be uh, rewarded with lunch once we have had this panel. There we are, an extra chair. Right. So you're Rachel, aren't you? Yes. And good morning. You're Nicola. Yeah. You are Stuart. Definitely. And yeah, Rachel's on my left. Oh, and then <laughs> we've got um, Karen, haven't we? And then we've got Helen, haven't we? Yes, right. And yes, we've got, I thought there was another. Um, yeah, you might want to just push your chairs back a little. We've got a huge panel here. Mm. Um. <laughs> or pithy comment. Mm. Um. Right, well, we will try to pull some of this uh, together before we have lunch. We've got some of the bosses. Um, they've been listening to most of what's gone on before. There's a lot being done, but so much more to achieve in this industry, and it won't be achieved unless there's strong direction from the top. Uh, so that's what we want to hear something about, uh, of course, in this panel, as well as additional ideas. Now, let me set out who they all are, which will be an interesting test of uh, whether I can uh, um, master names and titles of six different people. So here on my right, we've got Nicola Barclay, uh, who we already heard from in uh, questions earlier, Chief Executive of Homes for Scotland. Uh, and then we've got Stuart Baisley, who is executive chairman of the House Building Federation. And then moving the other way, we've got Rachel Roxborough, who also took part in one <coughs> of our asked questions in our earlier discussions, chief executive of Delalio Rugby Works. You can tell us a bit about what that is and so on when you introduce yourself. Uh, then we've got Karen Jones, who is uh, HR director of Red Row Homes. Um, and we have Helen Moore, uh, <coughs> Managing Director of City and Country, who's also spoken briefly earlier. And then we've got John Anderson, Executive Director of Kia. So a good selection of leading figures uh, in this industry. Um, and again, I'm going to ask you all just to kick us off just briefly uh, with anything else you want to tell us about your organization. And the one, what's the one 
thought you would take from today or you want to tell everybody today about the issues we've been discussing. Who wants to go first? Nicola, do you want to have a go first? Mm. Why not? Um, most of you will have no idea who Homes for Scotland are, but if I tell you that I'm the Scottish version of Stuart, it might put things into a little bit more perspective. We represent the home building industry north of the border. I've been in post a couple of years now, and the very first policy I implemented was flexible working, because I am a woman and I quite like flexibility and have other things I'd like to do with my time. But the first two people that came through my office door and asked me for flexible working were two young dads who wanted to spend a bit more time with their kids and it helped with the funding <coughs> of childcare if they could do compressed hours and have one day off a week. So we think of flexible working as something suiting women, but actually it suits everybody and especially the slightly younger generation of dads and I'm delighted to see that they want to be actively involved in their child rearing. So that's one thing, just picking up from the previous conversations. Um, other things I wanted to say, you can't be what you can't see. I've just finished reading Harriet Harman's book on the working woman, and that is quoted so many times throughout it. If we don't push ourselves forward as women into the leadership roles, no other younger women will think that they can do it. And I wasn't particularly comfortable with the idea of becoming chief exec for all sorts of reasons. I thought I probably couldn't do it. But I thought, actually, I had a duty to all the women that I know in the industry that they would feel as though I'd let them down if I didn't give it a go. Two years later, love it, and I'll say it myself, I think I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> right, <laughs> good. Well, on that uplifting note, um, let's, well, let's go straight to your counterpart in England then. Uh, well, I mean, are you pretty good at it too? I have no idea. And I, <laughs> <laughs> but I will, say, I will say Nicola is very good at it. So, um, <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we enjoy, I think, better, closer working relationships with Homes for Scotland now than we've ever done, which is fantastic. Yeah. And I think Nicola's been a major driver and a large part of that process. So I'm delighted that she's doing it and clearly enjoying it. Um, look, HBF represents the builders of about 80% of the homes. And you know, we have a range of issues that we have to grapple with. And this is clearly one of them, because my office is a bit like a barometer. Chief executives wander into it, like John and others. And after we've got through the pleasantries, they you know, very quickly tell me what's front of their minds. And that changes over time. But clearly, for the last three or four years, the entire skills issue, which is very broad and a very big issue, is something which I think as an industry we've woken up to very late in every aspect of it, and we've talked about just about every aspect of it through the course of what has been a very interesting morning for the books that I've been at. And so I ask myself, you know, the question that I always ask when I'm looking at this, because HBF is, is really two things. We are there to represent our members and to do our members' bidding with, you know, some of William's colleagues or ex-colleagues in political circles as we argue for appropriate housing policy. Government is deeply interested in skills, having said that, and part of our role has to be leadership. It's not just good enough all the time that we simply sit back and take the views on board of our members and then represent those members. From time to time, we have to take a lead, and I've done this on a few things in my 10 or 12 years that I've been at the helm of HBF. I did it on the whole zero carbon agenda, embraced it and tried to make something of it. I did it on the customer service agenda, created the customer satisfaction survey that is now part of the culture of the industry. And I'm now seeking to do this on the whole skills, diversity, attraction agenda. But it's tough. And it's tough because people are waking up to it pretty slowly. And I think that's come out of the discussions we've had this morning. And the key role for organizations like HBF, and to some extent Homes for Scotland as well, although well, clearly you know, in a slightly different place in terms of the size of the ge geography and a lot of crossover of members is to try and identify what we can do that is different to what is actually going on out in the countries. Because we've heard this morning, and you'll hear more in a minute, I'm sure, about things that are happening, excellent things that are happening in a range of companies across the country. Uh, and not everybody's at the same, in the same place on this. But what can HBF and organizations like HBF do that supplements and actually adds value to those great things that are happening out there? And that's why we decided Two years ago, or a little longer than two years ago, we actually set up the Home Building Skills Partnership that came into being two years ago. Jenny, who you heard from earlier, is doing a fantastic job leading on that for us, and she's also now championing and working with me on diversity and issues around that within HBF, because we've had our eyes open, frankly, through this process. So I don't want to talk too much more about all the stuff we're doing, because maybe more of that will come <coughs> out during the conversation. But I think what I would say is that I recognize as an industry leader 
the severity, the difficulty, the challenge that we face. I'm trying to get everybody else to recognize that in every shape and form that I can. You'll see a lot of things from me about it in written and spoken word in the months and years ahead. But I don't underestimate just how difficult the challenge is. And we've heard some fantastic stories this morning. The, the one from the, uh, the, the woman working on the site in, in London just now, which drew a round of applause, you know, really touched my heart in lots of ways. And there are lots of stories like that out there, and we need to get into those. So I think, it's, I think the biggest mm -hmm. thing for us is about leadership and driving change. Okay, thank you. Well, we'll come back to some of those things. Let's just hear from the others. Rachel, <coughs> you're a leader in a different type of organization. Yeah, very really. different mm -hmm. organization, but uh, all facing similar challenges. So um, Delalia Rugby Works was set up by Lawrence. Uh, shockingly, over 40,000 young people will be excluded from school each year. And what happens to them is they get put into alternative provision. Um, at Delalia Rugby Works, what we do is, um, let's drop paint on the floor. Um, <laughs> We, we work with the permanently excluded, and we, we have targeted 14 to 16-year-olds uh, within those schools, but we work with them on a three-year skills-based program. Um, and what we found is there's this huge, great gap in their education, which means they have really appalling attainment levels when they come out of school. So um, just over 1% will get five GCSEs. And reading in the magazine that that's an entry level for a lot of apprenticeships, it suddenly puts our young people in a very vulnerable position when they leave school. So we, we work on a schools-based program. And one of the things that we've, we've looked at is how do you measure um, progress with these young people? Um, we can, we've got some hard KPIs that we set. Um, I think I, I talked earlier about the fact we organize employability taster days. Um, and that's easy to measure. You know, how many young people are going on these? What do they get out of them? But a big part of what we do is the soft skills side. You know, a lot of these kids have been excluded for behavioral reasons. And so one of the big things we look at are um, the values around rugby because it was set up by Lawrence. And one of them is leadership. And we have a behavior matrix. And we design this behavior matrix in conjunction with employers to say to them, what skills do you find are lacking in the young generation coming into your business? And um, there was a variety, you know, it was around reliability, attitude, communication, but leadership was one of them. So we have taken that and we build that into the curriculum. Um, so our coaches work with these young people to try and build up these skills. Um, you know, Lawrence has a phrase which is, you are what you're exposed to. Um, I think that's been actually quite a common thread with so many of the discussions this morning. And the exposure that these young people have is very negative um, because of the, their home life. But more importantly is around careers advice. And so their expectation of a career is fairly low. Careers uh, within these schools, there is an assumption that if you're a female, you go into hairdressing. If you're a boy, you go into mechanics. It's very, very stereotypical. So a big part of the role that our coaches play when, uh, when they, they work in these schools with these young people is looking at how they can mentor them into uh, a career that's sustainable. And I suppose... Um, you know, the construction industry is, is an area that a lot of our young people have shown interest in, in which is why we've got this great partnership with, with Rupert and Watt House. Um, and I suppose the point I want to get across is what value is actually placed on soft skills versus hard skills that allow our young people to have any chance in a competitive landscape? Right. Thank you. That's another thing we can debate. So, Karen, you go next. Yes. Hello, everybody. I really wanted to move the conversation on from attracting people on the quality of our new entrant programmes, which I think we, we, we are on the upward curve there, and to talk about a sort of leadership that we need to show as employers and individuals to keep those people, and not just keep them, but get them to fulfil their potential for themselves and, and for the sector. And when I was thinking about it, there's all the structures that we put in place, so career planning, succession planning, um, you know, all the things that we do for people, career ladders and so on. And to me, that's almost just the, the starting point. And I was thinking about what really makes the difference, where we can demonstrate some leadership. And I think the key thing to me, and it's something I'm trying to concentrate a lot on in my day job at the moment, is I think we need to treat people well, if I could summarise it like that. We talk about talent, but talent is a bunch of individuals with their own agendas, 
what's important to them when they're 20 is different to when they're 30 or 40. And I think we need to really challenge ourselves as employers to try and work with that. I think there was two things I really wanted to focus on, which I'm doing in, in, in my own role at the moment. And one is the commitment of the senior management. I know it's an old cliche. I don't mean HR and L&D. I take that as read. The senior people who drive that organisation, if they see that as part of their job to develop people and nurture people and keep them, then it will happen. And I think there's a lot of HR professionals in this room. I think we need to really ask ourselves, are we in a company where that can happen? I like to think I am, but you know, I think we always need to keep challenging. Is that the way? And um, I think my second point was, I think we need to challenge ourselves to be better employers in this sector. Um, I, we've done a lot of work on it lately, but I think we can do more. And I mean by that, by treating people better, by taking more account of their individual circumstances, by making it easy for them to stay with us when times are tough. And that's things we've talked about before, like be more personal, be more flexible, showing a bit more imagination and trying to move away from the, um, the sort of worship of work ethic and, and think about how we can manage that. So I think they're, they're the things that I'd like to first mm -hmm. to add to the pot today. Thank you. Right. Okay. And Helen, you are the managing director of your yeah. company, so you're one of well. these senior people <laughs> we're talking about. Um, what do you think? Well, I was I actually, I think Karen's moved that on very nicely, that discussion point, because for me, I think my role, if you talk about, lead, we talk about leadership, I believe my role in the organisation is to set that strong corporate culture about what's right, what we're about <coughs> as an organisation, how do we treat our team, who do we recruit to ensure that actually we create the best opportunity for success in the long run, that they actually become a fantastic team of people who work well together and can have a shared vision as well. For me, I have to, I have to set with my team a, a vision that everyone can follow and can buy into. We know our industry, all of us in here know our industry is fantastically <coughs> exciting, challenging, rewarding, something you can be, feel proud of at the end of the day. But actually, in all of those exciting things, it's actually really hard work what we do to deliver our projects. And if we allow things like the debate on diversity and all of those things not to be an inherent part of our culture to understand the importance of getting a variety of different people into the organization and actually the skills that come with those people. I mean, when I joined the industry, I've only ever worked in, in, in the property industry. When I joined, I was one of three females who weren't um, admin staff in our business. And there were 350 of us at the time. And, and actually, when I look now, I think through my career, I've only ever sat on a board where, um, except now, because there's me and my sales and marketing director, I've only ever sat on a board as the one female. And, and we really, really need to have it such that we get more role models in um, and that we also think about the retention of those people another point that was made. How do we make, I love the point made by this lady over here who was working on the site earlier, because we can talk about lots of points about what we need to do <coughs> out there in, you know, in, in the leadership team, but what's it really like working on site? You know, the fact is that it's, it's tough. It's really tough. You've got to be, you've got to have broad shoulders in, in, in our industry as a female go out on site and to actually say, I want you to do this and get them to do it and do it with a smile and not be a bitch because you managed to achieve it. I mean, I, I unfortunately, I'm probably slightly less PC in the way I, I talk about these issues, but that's because I've been in this industry and I know it well and I know that we need to change, but we are changing and, and, and it's that it's really, really important about setting your culture for your business that the, the team buy into that and see that that's part of our success going forward. So, John, do you share that perspective of this cultural change? Do you know there are, there are so many... You, you, you sit through this morning, what it, what it reminds you is how, 
how big the challenge is that we face as, as an industry. And I think it's, there are some, some amazing things that are thrown this morning. I think great, great day, Rupert, really interesting. Um, for, for, first and foremost, just an, an, obs an obs observation. I think I, I, I do quite a few things like this, this, as Stuart does. And I think it's the first panel that I've been on that I've been in a minority, yep. uh, which is great. You're going to have um, to get used to it. The way it's going to go, <laughs> if all these ideas are implemented. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the other thing that comes across very strongly is the fact that no one company uh, can stand alone and effectively do it, uh, do it alone. Um, we're, we developed the Shaping Your World program that is, that is basically brand neutral uh, some time ago. And uh, the intention of that program was to try and encourage kids to look at the house building industry, look at the built environment in a very different way. We launched that uh, going back nine months ago and through, through various kind of shopping, shopping centers. And so the idea was that you got your senior people in the shopping center, they go and speak to the parents, they have kids, um, speak to the parents, speak to the kids, try and encourage more people to look at, the, look, at, look at the industry differently. Apart from the fact that I felt like a bit of a child catcher chasing after these families. It was um, fascinating to speak to the parents and then speak to the kids. So the kids, I didn't come across any kids at all that were considering the built environment as a career. Um, yet, when you speak to the, to the parents, um, virtually every, every parent I spoke to had some relationship with building, whether it be in the trades, whether it be professional, whether it be estate agency, finance, whatever. And it's fascinating, I came into this career because uh, my family was, was in house building. Uh, my my, my uh, uncle was a, was a house builder. I followed him in his footsteps. footsteps. Um, and a huge number of us have actually followed in that same career path. So your parents, your family, you follow the same general direction. Yet, none of the people I spoke to at that weekend launch were um, interested in, in, in following the same path. So I think, I think the industry's got a massive, a massive in, uh, image problem. Um, so the other stat that came out of that, uh, that event was 73% of all parents do not want their kids, do not want their kids to go into the construction industry. 73%. Um, so skills partnership, fantastic event. Jenny, I think you're doing, I can't see you, Jenny, Jenny, fantastic job. Um, I think the, the whole industry has to lift its game. We are, we are building properties, we're building homes that are, I don't think as, a, as an industry, we're <coughs> developing the method of construction quickly enough. We're still building properties in the same form that we're building 300 years ago, for God's sake. But if you actually look inside the home and you look at what's happening inside the home and the, the, not just the method of construction, but the components that are moving in, the nest, the heating, the voice activation, all those things that are gonna essentially make our product really sexy. We need to promote our industry in such a way that the, the consumer and the consumer's kids see it as an exciting place to be. It's not just dirt and muck and weather and all the rest of stuff. We are building products <coughs> that actually are really exciting. One final, one final point. I had a conversation with, uh, with the parents and it was, I asked them the question, how many of you as parents, when you were kids, used to draw a house? <coughs> just literally draw the house, used to draw rooms, used to put yourself in them, you used to draw a big house with a, with a front door. You go into any primary school um, and you'll see pictures of houses, fronts of houses, big shaped houses with doors and windows that are either too small or too big. Everyone's done it yet, they, they get lost to the industry. Why is it that, that we can have a culture that is so interested in housing, yet so unappealing? Just doesn't, just doesn't make sense. It's to do with culture right. a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, very interesting point. I must say, as someone who's had a career in politics, having, thinking you've got lots of good things to say, but people find it unappealing is a really familiar situation <laughs> uh, to be in. Uh, so you're not alone in your industry, and this is a common problem. Um, but is it, um, let, just let me ask one question before we uh, throw it open to everybody. Is there some big thing we're missing here, or you are all describing good things happening in your organizations, there's a lot of incremental change going on, a lot of good work going on, but are we missing a big idea? Should we be doing, um, is there some great new initiative that should be a law? You know, if I was the still in government, the Minister for Housing, and I was asking you this question, what would you say? Should there be a, a university of house building established? Should there be 
great conferences held, you know, this, but a hundred times bigger, which really highlight the industry and the cultural change and really get it entrenched uh, in some way. Are, are we missing an idea in the industry or is it going to be enough for, for this, the changes you're talking about to seep through and incrementally be okay. added to, uh, what, what do you think? Uh, I, 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 I always look at what STEM has achieved by grouping mm -hmm. together under that really good umbrella. They've done lots of work on diversity and getting people into the industry. So I, I do think collaboration is the key, but I wonder if there's a snappier thing than House Builder Skills Partnership, maybe, if we, if we could. We, we did talk at, at some length at CITB about trying to move house building in, in, into STEM, but they're quite mm -hmm. protective of it. But, but it's almost a, it's a brand. It's a brand, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, Nicola, what do you think? Mm. One of the biggest barriers, and I'd hate to be the one that's talking about the negativity of it, is that house building in general doesn't have a particularly good perception out there in the general public through the media. Um, most times people <coughs> read about house building is when somebody is trying to build in a field behind their house and they're objecting to it. <laughs> so there is an automatic negative perception of what we do as an industry. And I don't think we have been very good at promoting the benefits of, of home building to the country, <coughs> to the economy, to people's life chances. You know eradicating fuel poverty, all these things that we all know because we work within the industry, but we've been very poor at selling that um, positivity out to the general public, which is why we continue to just see the negative media about the mm -hmm. old regular building in that field behind the house and they don't like it. So until we can overcome that and start to be a, an industry that is perceived to be doing good and that people actually then want to engage with, those out with the industry, I think we'll struggle. So that's, you know, it's it's media relations, <coughs> the really strong messaging of, of the benefits of the industry. I think there's uh, a great... Oh, sorry. Uh, no, well, but, uh, you go, uh, go on, uh, Helen, and then uh, John, and you then go, Helen. Jump, sorry. <laughs> yeah. go for it, John. I think, I think, the, um, I think, I think there are two, there are, there's a macro and a micro here. Uh, the macro is the fact that we, for decades, haven't been building enough houses, and we think that we can come along with an idea or a policy or a change that will effectively shift it overnight. It's, it's not going to happen overnight. What we have to accept, as a, and, and this, is, this is not so much a political statement, but I think it's 10 uh, housing ministers over the last 11 years or whatever it is, but fundamentally we have to, yeah, so we, we have to see, we have to see this <coughs> as being a long-term <laughs> solution to a long-term problem. Um, I think the industry is, is changing significantly. I think the, you know, the existence of this panel now uh, is that there are improvements. It will take a long time. It will take the entire industry to pick up. You've got 70, companies now on the home, home skills partnership. Um, yes, there was a massive amount that we could do, but fundamentally I think there is a move forward. There, there is no doubt that to fix the <coughs> skills problem, we have to find a modern way of generating and building houses that effectively takes it off-site. Yeah. But th there's, ju there's just no doubt about that. I think that whole process, uh, the industry, frustrating as it is, I think the industry hasn't yet matured to the point that the private house builder can afford to effectively use it in great volume. But, but until we get some kind of public subsidy from a, from a government perspective or some kind of sponsorship from the public perspective to take the skills off-site and start to manufacture houses in the same way as the car industry did a few years ago through... Uh, do you need public changes. subsidy to do that? I think, not a, I think modern a pioneering company can't say. I think, I think modern method of construction um, is at the moment challenging. The viability is challenging. I don't, I don't, I don't think there is one house builder that exists, and obviously you've got, you've, there are, there are, there are a number, num number here, but I don't think there's one house builder that exists that would not want to be able to add the variety of off-site manufacturing, Stuart, I don't know if you agree with this, but I don't think there's one house builder that wouldn't want to do it, but the challenge of finding a site and then finding a building method that allows you to go off and build houses, not necessarily quicker, but in a different way, is just too expensive. It's the, it's the friction of how you manage to, for, for off-site to work, it, it seems to me at least, it has to have the ability to be replicated en masse. Yeah. And the entire planning system is actually set up to avoid that. So, we, so thus it's very difficult because we spend our entire lives negotiating planning consents with local authorities and councillors and so on and so forth, all of whom want individuality and don't want to hear anything about standardised design because they want it to look different, feel different. And yet, if you're actually, if you're building a McDonald's drive-in or you're building a Premier Inn, you can do that off-site because so much of it, because you actually live on site. 
but all their houses are not the same, so that's that, that's one of the big challenges there. Sorry, I cut across your... No, that's right, we did say Helen could come back in. No, in. that's fine. Um, what <coughs> I would say is that we were talking about the negative the perception around our industry um, and concerns, but actually I think there's best opportunity ever now um, there's, I mean, in all of my career, there has never been more discussion and debate about the need for new housing in the UK and the, the massive undersupply. And actually, we're now moving to a point um, where I said to William earlier on, it is, it's true, every political party <coughs> recognises it has to be a good thing now for our society. Yeah. It's essential. And now's the chance and the opportunity to turn things around. But actually, I, you did say earlier, William, you might want to put down some things you might like to take back to your colleagues. And, <laughs> My and, former and colleagues. Using, <laughs> former colleagues. I, former I, colleagues. Yes. Former colleagues. I don't want to be bracketed too close. Sorry. <laughs> but um, but, but <coughs> the negativity around our industry is also very much coming from the politicians too. Mm -hmm. This whole debate about land banking, if I hear it one more time, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, nobody, <coughs> if anyone stopped, and if they had a housing minister for long enough to actually understand the point, that actually <laughs> it doesn't make mm -hmm. sense. We can't mm -hmm. buy expensive land and sit on it. We have to get on and build it. And the whole debate is always about You've either got the point about, I don't want houses in my backyard because my house is now um, um, worth loads of money and I'm worried you're going to devalue it. So you get that <coughs> point. Then you get government constantly saying, oh, nasty house builders, what they do is they buy this land, they sit on it and wait for it to go up in value, which couldn't be further from the truth. And then you also get, unfortunately, where where quality hasn't been good enough, you get the other end, where understandably you've got people who say, I bought this house, it's the most expensive purchase I've ever had in my life, and it's not good enough quality. So those are the three elements that we have to address. And, and I really do think, I would love the opportunity, as I'm sure um, some of my uh, colleagues in other businesses, to actually really tell the reality of what it's like trying to deliver um, housing that we all need in such a challenging environment. I know everyone uh, laughs and says, oh, you poor, it's always say, oh, you poor house builders, poor, poor things. You know, you say, oh, it's this, it's the planning system, it's skill shortage, it's this, it's that. But it's true. It, that is absolutely true. And I think that we have an opportunity and a challenge now to turn that round because we're now in a position where actually people do recognise that their grandchildren aren't going to be able to afford a house. That actually maybe it is okay if there's some new housing now because my grandchild might be able to then afford to buy something. And so therefore, we should now take that opportunity to turn it round, make it sound more exciting and interesting. We all know it's a fabulous career. We just need to get people whose parents or, or family weren't involved. Actually, mine weren't. I was just lucky. But the fact of the matter, I just fell into it. But the fact is that is <coughs> for so many people. So let's try and use that to be positive as a team. It's true. You know, we, um, we've just seen a 74% increase in output in four years. We delivered 217,000 homes last year. When you think about where we were 10 years ago in the economic recession, it's a remarkable achievement by any standards. We've grown our workforce through that period, trained our workforce through that period. I totally accept there have been um, issues around quality, relatively minority. You know, I'll be announcing figures next week which suggest that 86% um, of customers would recommend their, their home builder to their best friend uh, out of a sample of something like 60 or 70,000 people who was, well, we send out 100 or 1,000 surveys and we got about a 60% response rate. That's up a couple of points in the last year. So during that period of growth, that demonstrates what companies are doing. And actually, I think we and the government should be celebrating this tremendous success. And that would undoubtedly help tackle some of these industry image issues, which have taken 25 to 30 years to cement themselves in public perception. It wasn't the case when I came into this industry. Bizarrely. I mean, you know, I, I left school without a clue what I was going to do. I had three key interests at school. One was economics, one was politics, and one was 
or not at school I didn't have a good interest in housing but I had a family interest in housing a bit like John and I was told very clearly that I wasn't clever enough to be an economist. I wasn't a good enough speaker to be a young William Hague in terms of my oratory skills, and so housing seemed the obvious. You're thing. doing fine, by the way. <laughs> housing seemed the obvious thing. I'm now often I'm now often asked if I'd like to be a politician. I don't know why that is. But, um, perhaps because I've done so much of this. But uh, but when I joined the industry back in the 1980s, it was actually a very exciting, vibrant place to be. And if you look at the household names that you know you're representing today, actually the Red Row and Keir and others, Barrett, Barrett's 60 years old this year. Persimmon was founded in 1971, Crest in 1962, and so on and so forth. So most of today's household names actually grew up as businesses through the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. There are not too many companies actually in the last 25 years, despite this extraordinary economic environment that we've had, which have been able to replicate that. And, and so we have, you know, what, what I think I'm saying in a very long-winded fashion, and, and, and probably too long-winded, is that this is a very complex issue. That the, the, in trying to tackle skills and attraction and retention and diversity and all the other things that we've talked about this morning, you cannot unfortunately disentangle it from the bigger picture of where housing sits. Mm -hmm. And politically, it's becoming absolutely critical for the reasons that we've identified. And, and if you look at the way voting patterns are changing, and particularly in the last election, and the change in home ownership aspirations and, mm -hmm. and ability to execute that for younger people under 40, you know, 60% of the under 40s were owner occupiers 10 or 12 years ago. Today, it's only a third. It's no surprise that politicians are very focused on this cohort of the population and what, they can, what can be done about it. And hence, the pressure will continue to be on us to you know, great, you've done 74%, go and do another 74%. You know, it's not good enough. It's a bit like being back at school in that sense. Um, but, but it does send the subliminal message into society. And, you know, mm -hmm. we've been doing a huge amount of work, as you know, I, I suspect Jenny told you earlier, with colleges, and you made the point about primary school children. Now, Jenny will get, tell me if I get this wrong, as I often do, as you know. But there's a couple of hundred thousand students finishing their education between 16 and 18 in construction-related courses. Very few of those end up working in construction-related industries. So not only do we have them when they're seven and they're drawing their Lego houses or whatever, but actually at 16 they're showing you know, some kind of interest at least. Now I accept a proportion of them are just looking for some way to finish their education because it, you know, they have to stay in school till they're 18. We need to do more about capturing those people. Can, can I yes. just say something very quickly? Yes, do, that? and then I'm just going to see if there's any questions um, uh, in the audience. I think as leaders it's our role to break down those assumptions. Mm -hmm. And it's been quite interesting for us. There's been a lot of discussion today about how you engage in the education system to um, promote the industry. And when we were designing our, our program and looking at this whole employability element, how we engage or disengage young people, um, it had to be the practical element. So taking them off site and taking them onto, into a building, into a, a, a working environment, breaking down those <coughs> barriers for them but also you know, exposing them to all the different jobs that exist within that one building. So when they think of construction, they were thinking about the end site, and they had no vision beyond that. And as a result of the work we've been doing with people like McGee, we now have young people wanting to become surveyors, because they've suddenly realized there is a pathway there that's achievable for them. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not trying to tackle the education system, because I think again, the number of ministers. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is true. Um, <laughs> we've got about five minutes before we have lunch. Anybody want to raise a quick question, observation on these, any of these issues? Yes, sir, over there. Yeah, third row back. Hi, I'm Matthew Finch, a graduate of Bridgewater Homes. There's been some really good points about attracting people into the construction industry. But if we can just wind the clock back a little bit to the very first debate, about young apprentices. A lot of young people go into the construction industry with the view of getting away from classroom-based activities. However, they often need a C grade in maths or English to um, complete their apprenticeship, which is taken on alongside their apprenticeships, which sometimes they, they battle. Is there a way that this can be taught um, more relevant to their role than classroom based. Mm -hmm. Working with yeah. colleagues is a really important one. It's, um, I, I know because of SE principles and their biggest department for Needs and Construction Colleges is their maths and English to get people through the skills they have to do. And these are youngsters that didn't get it at school. They don't want to stay on at school and it is actually holding people back. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to ever devalue an apprenticeship 
but we have to find a way of making it more applied. We're losing good people. Mm -hmm. and goes that's back the only to reason they're not soft skills it. versus hard skills for us. Any other question point? Yes, uh, there at the, at the back, in the middle at the back. I don't want to make this too long in terms of picking up so many threads, but Ashley, and I was talking to another break, mentioned the difference just between Denmark and here, where mm -hmm. they multi-skill automatically. And whether we need 25,000 bricklayers or not, it would make sense that the more of those that are multi-skilled, the better. But it also struck me that, especially finishing with this panel, the leadership issue really comes back to, as you've already mentioned at least once, the big vision of whether that's an overriding vision that a panel could agree on, but it's apparent that many of the individuals have visions in their business. Mm. What tools are you using or are available to establish that type of thinking? Because I don't think it is confined to a development time horizon. It cannot be, by definition. Otherwise, what do you do after the, the next development? Okay, I'll take some final comments from the panel in a moment. Then. Anybody else wanted to jump in before before that? Everybody's hungry, I think, now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's one. Yes, okay, last one. Lady over there. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, hello. Faye Skadden from NHBC. Um, probably seems a really obvious question, actually, but, you know, I was watching TV the other night, and... Um, teaching industry had got a new advert and I was watching my 12 year old son watching it and it was really impactful and it was very clever and it was very emotive and the army do the same thing so I know there's a bit of tinkering around the edges I would probably call it around social media advertising and some other advertising but why can't builders just pull budgets together and do some really serious marketing some really serious advertising on mainstream media so there's something in common with these questions about, you know, and uh, slightly related to what I was asking earlier, is there some big push mm -hmm. event, initiative, you know, that we're missing here? Um, any mm -hmm. final comments on that? And then we're going to wrap up. Yes, Jenny, John. Jenny referred when she was on the stage to, to a, a communication promotional campaign, which obviously I think in some respects that, that, that came campaign will respond hopefully uh, in some way to it. But I think the, the, that will only be... Uh, truly engaging if the entire industry picks up and carries on with it. Um, part of the reason why we did the Shaping the World was because we, we wanted to lead the industry. We're the, one of the biggest construction companies uh, in the industry. But one of the, one of the fascinating facts is that 400,000 people left the industry in 2007 when the, when the market collapsed. 400,000 people. We, the workforce increased by 45,000 last year. We need 400,000 a year. <coughs> in every single year for the next five years just to build the 300,000 mm -hmm. houses we're talking about. So this is, this is, this is not a small issue. I'd have to say, not wanting to come back onto the politics of it, I think the, the real frustration for, for me, and I, I don't want to bring press to, to, to represent the panel, but the, the real frustration for me politically is the constant tinkering with policy, the constant tinkering with the, with the, with the, with the built environment and the assumption that you can make a massive change for an issue that has been with us for decades. Um, and I think all parties need to get together. All parties need to sponsor and support, coming back to Helen's mm -hmm. point about uh, not necessarily criticised. I've never known the industry to have so many incentives mm -hmm. and so many things being thrown at it to fix the problem. But I've, I've never known an industry that has been so misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other final comment? We will stop in a moment. Mm -hmm. I think you've all, you've all spoken very well. Okay, okay, we'll take Emma at the back. Uh, uh, and then we're, I'm going to wrap up. Sorry, just very quickly. In regards to the campaign, advertising campaign, we actually two years ago started doing one with um, quite a lot of other companies um, with um, CCS. And the biggest issue we faced was that um, government uh, organizations and private companies found it very difficult to work together because the um, loophole, well, the, the, the structure government organizations had to follow and the way the private sector worked was, was too different, that it was taking too long for everyone's needs to be met. Um, we had to have you know, the government companies going through OG in order to get anything passed. So we have tried, and um, there were about 15 of us around the table, and um, it never got anywhere because it just took too long. So 
picking right. up on the advert, we, we did try. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is a sobering uh, point on that. <laughs> Puts into perspective the difficulties. Um, well, uh, look, uh, look, I think you all agree we've had a very interesting few hours here. We've had some inspirational individual uh, stories and accounts. We've had some great examples from many companies and organizations of the thinking and work that is going on that is very much in the right direction. I must say, from outside the industry, Right, although you can't predict the future of any <coughs> industry, if you just do the, the simple maths here, it has some very clear lessons. We are expecting the population of this country to grow by about a quarter of a million or a third of a million every year for the next 30 years in a country that already has a housing shortage. There aren't many industries where you know for sure for the rest of your working <coughs> life you're going to have permanent high demand, apart from cyclical variations, as people have pointed out. And so there is so much to um, go at here, but also if you look at the numbers of people being trained in the necessary skills, there is no way currently of meeting the, um, uh, the demand uh, that, is going to be, that is building up for the future. Therefore, what we've talked about on diversity and inclusion and making the most of everybody's skills at many different levels um, is of crucial importance. So we're going to write this up in various ways. I will write an article in What House magazine <laughs> about what we have uh, <laughs> discussed today. And uh, Rupert will no doubt incorporate it in other ways. Uh, personally, I will pass some of this on to my former colleagues, Colleague. and I hope also <laughs> within all the organizations represented here today, you've also learned a lot from each other. So thank you very much. Rupert, you're going to wrap us up, and we'll have some lunch. Mm. Uh, yes, well, th thank you very much. Actually, just to let you know, my sales team will be taking your checks for generic promotional marketing <laughs> for you homes <laughs> that will go across all our platforms, including television. But no, um, thank you very much for that. Um, I actually wanted to there was so much fascinating um, stuff there, which will all be uh, in the supplement going in Sharehouse magazine, will be online, et cetera, and we'll be obviously following this through. Um, and interesting, uh, tying up with, with Redrow and, and leadership, I think a, just a very short little anecdote, which I think sums up the whole thing, and, and I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying this, is obviously Redrow chairman and founder, Steve, Steve Morgan. Now, uh, he wouldn't mind me saying that he went through a few schools in his time growing up. Um, and it may have, may have been sort of Ashley's Mr. Norman's father, maybe, given, given, given the age, uh, said to uh, young Morgan, age 16, um, getting in trouble, said, Morgan, if you don't pull your socks up, you'll end up working on a building site. Um, now you probably say, what first attracted you to house building, billionaire Steve Morgan? <laughs> there are opportunities. Um, it's a fantastic industry. There's an awful lot to do. Um, but, you know, we love it. There's some um, fantastic people in, in the audience, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much to all our panels who've been absolutely mm -hmm. sensational. Um, I think we'll all agree as well that we've had a fantastic um, chair across all our panels, Lord Haig. We would, um, I think, as I said at the start, he's, uh, he's gathered an awful lot of information and knowledge about our industry. Um, I was going to suggest maybe he goes back and um, asks Theresa May if he'd become housing czar but I think the word czar in the current <laughs> geopolitical climate <laughs> 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 might, not, might not be the quite the right title. But anyway, um, just a big thank you. I um, want to thank um, our team, Clem and Joe, and all our team at White House and Shouse for putting on this great event. Thank you very much uh, to all our delegates here. Thank you very much to all our panelists. And thank you very much, William Haig. And lunch is served. Thank you. Lunch is served. Thank you.